Ready to play the music? Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm afraid you need to put your headphones on <laughs> in order to hear. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session of Research and Innovation Days. Uh, my name is Signa Rotso. I'm Deputy Director General of DG Research and Innovation. Uh, this is the second day of Research and Innovation Days, uh, with which we celebrate 40 years since the first uh, framework program on research and innovation. Uh, looking at the program, we still have a full day of inspiring sessions ahead of us. But let me uh, get straight to the topic. Deploying research and innovation results to decarbonize energy intensive industries such as steel, cement and chemicals. And it's my great pleasure to be accompanied uh, in this uh, session uh, with the wonderful panel uh, of, uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Henrietta Spiro. Uh, who's Director General for Technology at the Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology of Austria, and uh, Ms. Ilse Kenis, uh, Chief Decarbonization Officer uh, uh, and the CEO of Kermers uh, Technologies. Thank you very much for your availability uh, to be with me on stage today. And actually, I have to admit that this time I'm quite happy to have this kind of gender unbalanced panel, uh, particularly uh, having in mind uh, the, uh, the, uh, the topic of the session uh, that we have for today. Uh, but it's um, just a, a couple of words by means of introduction. Uh, the uh, European industries need to transform to meet our common 2050 climate neutrality goals. Uh, but this transformation must also allow for them to stay and thrive in Europe uh, and being uh, global competitive leaders. For energy industry, uh, intensive industries, as mentioned, such as cement, steel, chemicals, the climate neutrality path is not at all straightforward. Uh, and really, this is now the issue we are uh, going to discuss today, but particularly uh, because it's Research and Innovation Days, our Research and Innovation uh, Framework programs, Horizon 2020 and now Horizon Europe, have very much been supportive, supportive uh, of the energy intensive industries along this path. And before we start uh, the discussion, we also have a video uh, to show you. Uh, let's have a look at one of the examples. Well, I believe it's one piece of a big puzzle. We are aiming for 100% decarbonization, which of course is a big challenge, but 100% can only be taken one step at a time. And I think retrofit is one of those steps. The Retrofit project has been and is a very, very interesting project because we are part of a consortium in which there are many industrial partners coming from different nations and we have the opportunity to share the experience in different sectors. And together we had the possibility to discuss about what is possible to do in the next future for decarbonization. That is very interesting for us to know how they are working and how they are facing their problems and know better how we can help them. We have two main results that can be very interesting for Europe. So the first one is the artificial intelligence that we are developing in the projects. And also the other one is the decision support system, the DSS. The main purposes of the project are to improve the decarbonization in Europe. Uh, another important target is to uh, improve our digitalization level. I think the most important points of the project is to work along the whole value chain of the process, from the raw material version to the end, and all this wrapped with the modernization and DSS systems. The challenge now is huge to decarbonize, and this project deals with this in a very simple way. What we can do in an old plant to improve its performance regarding decarbonization. 
I believe that it's a good mixture of uh, physical, technical challenges and uh, their analytics and knowledge part. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good path. We developed uh, different uh, ways uh, to modify and to retrofit our process. We have uh, learned a lot uh, about this kind of replacement. We know what we can do and what we cannot do and how we can go on in the next few years. We have started pathway to reach the zero emission, but this is only the first step in our trip and we, we had the opportunity to evaluate something, but we are at the beginning of this kind of pathway. The partners of the project are examples of the most important sectors in which the decarbonization must be done. We have demonstrated that we can adapt our installation or processes to new raw materials or to new fuels for processes. So this is a very good result. I think in the end we are a sort of hub of all the knowledge that comes from each different experience of the project. So I think it was a pretty peculiar and an important role and we're glad that we did a very good job. Now, what we have seen uh, with this example, with retrofit, is how a well-designed uh, project can uh, contribute on several levels. Uh, it can put forward a new technological solutions uh, with multiple sectors. Uh, it can work along the value chain with demonstrators and several countries across the EU, as you saw on the map. Uh, it can also focus on how to keep and use existing infrastructures, make most of the digital solutions and at the same time uh, consider the cost of change. Now the question is whether uh, this is the overall situation regarding the scale up of uh, research and innovation transformative solutions for energy intensive industries. Uh, also the question uh, if public funding is effective uh, to reach climate neutrality or beauty patches uh, to a serious problem no one is able to truly tackle. And uh, will these industries uh, uh, manage or fail on climate neutrality as they worry also about uh, the, the global competitors, that the global competitors could get a leeway? So these are all very serious questions and with that in mind now I'd like to turn to our speakers uh, on stage uh, with me. Well, first of all, Henrietta, uh, given the climate 2050 neutrality agenda, all say 2030, 2040 climate targets and phase out of free allowances under the ETS, uh, for certain sectors. Now, how, in your view, are national research and innovation programs in Austria preparing your energy industry industries for such a major change? And do you think whether if you will be successful in that? Well, not being successful is not an option, I think. Uh, let's, let's be clear on that. And the challenge we all have is to decarbonize, but not to deindustrialize. Um, and what I really liked about um, the question you put is framing it as a race, uh, because we very often have the tendency to see a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, um, uh, competitiveness being a huge problem and a big challenge. And of course, they all are. But let's frame it as a race, actually a race to a better future. And that's really important. And this is also why research and innovation and research and innovation programs are so important. Um, thank you so much for presenting the Austrian perspective. And I do have to repeat the name of the ministry because it's important here. Because um, especially when it comes to decarbonizing energy intensive industry, um, it's a, we really do need a whole of government approach. So where I work, a ministry for climate action environment, energy, mobility, innovation and technology also already gives you a hint um, to, uh, towards all the different policy areas we try um, and combine. And we really are convinced that it needs this whole of government approach 
uh, to transform this industry, whilst at the same time being very clear on the fact that research and innovation is needed um, for, in my mind, two reasons. First of all, because the international energy tells us that one third of the technologies needed to actually be successful and decarbonize in 2050 is still at R&D stage. So this is why we are so, why it's so important to continue R&D funding. Um, and second of all, um, as you mentioned, Signa, this is about global competitiveness and we are a region with, with high wages, high experience. So the only chance we have is to stay on top of developments. And this is, we do that by R&D. Um, so how did we go about this in Austria? I obviously can give you a member state perspective here. Um, first of all, we, um, we obviously try and work evidence-based, as we all do. Uh, so we developed a number of uh, scientific studies and roadmaps that gave us an idea of how to actually go about uh, decarbonizing all the different sectors you mentioned. Uh, one of the most important studies was done by our largest RTO, by AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology. Uh, the new managing director is here, Brigitte. Sorry, I have to introduce you, but uh, this is a, a good opportunity, too good opportunity to miss. Um, what we also did, because I'm really convinced that we that the kind of policy making and the kind of initiative building we need for this huge challenge is, is new, right? We do have to go into real collaborative efforts and the, and the usual ways to go about it with, you know, policymakers making proposals and then industry going, oh, no, that's not enough or it's not good enough. And then we send papers back and forth. This is not going to be the way that leads us into, into the future. So what we did in Austria is really invite um, our, the, the largest 11 industrial companies from the steel sector, chemical, cement, etc., and really sit with them for two to three years and develop a joint action plan. Develop a joint action plan to actually make sure that uh, we have needs-based public support programs. And the reason I emphasize this is to make clear that RNI is a part of this puzzle. We developed a whole set of measures with RNI being an important part, but only a part. Um, we also uh, developed a new funding instrument. Uh, we uh, established the so-called Climate and Transition Fund, um, which became effective in 2023. Um, this includes 5.7 billion euros, of which 3 billion euros uh, go towards the transformation of industry. And there again, we established a new funding instrument where we combine RI funding with pilot lines, with demonstration lines, with industrial lines. This is still very much work in progress, I have to say. We tried and started, uh, we started last year, but it was really important for us to. to to go into this combination of measures uh, and, and exchange very well with the industry. Uh, we funded the first li uh, nine large-scale projects um, with a budget of 160 million euros. Um, in uh, three, three of these projects are actually within the, cement, uh, with the steel industry. So this is obviously the, the sector with the largest CO2 emissions in Austria, but also a sector which is very, very important for our industrial base, very, very important for our competitiveness, which is why it's so important to really go towards green steel. Um, with these first uh, nine projects, uh, we, we expect to save 2.4 million tons of CO2. And whoever is in, in the business of counting these reductions, you know, that really every ton counts. So 2.4 million tons is really quite a lot. Um, what we still need, and this is why I, I emphasize that this is still, still very much work in progress, um, is a better understanding of how we actually um, design the measures in a way that really supports industry. Um, and let's be clear about this. This really involves different funding agencies and different ministries working in a different way, also collaborating on this. Um, so we hope to, to make a better offer next year. Another point, because I sit in Brussels here, uh, obviously is to align uh, all our national activities with both European activities, but also with international activities. So Austria together with Australia, which is actually the biggest joke of this initiative, but it's, it's really nice. Austria and Australia uh, together lead um, the mission innovation on net zero industries. Um, and we actually really do have a first call, Austria and Australia opening in April. 
And I said before, it was really important to me with this first call to not fund only universities inducing CO2 by flying from Austria to Australia, but actually to make sure that there's industry demand for this cooperation. And, and we gathered this and hope uh, that we will have some successful product, uh, projects. Austria also coordinates uh, one of the European Union partnerships, uh, which are important, the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, that also has a part in industry decarbonization. I do have to mention one last point the Commission knows. Um, Australian companies were not successful in the uh, EU Innovation Fund. Uh, the framework conditions we found were less favourable because um, other countries had more or, or less costly renewable energies or are located where they can store carbon. Um, and this, this issue of having to transport carbon from Austria to somewhere made our projects more expensive. Um, and therefore, we weren't really successful in this fund. So we would really benefit from a rating system um, of project that respects the different starting positions. The Commission has heard this a lot, but I did have to mention it again. So, yeah. Well, many... <laughs> okay. Well, many, many thanks, Henriette, uh, uh, for that. Uh, and, and, and really, I, I think it's, uh, your efforts are, are really applaudable. <laughs> as, as, we, as we heard, particularly uh, the, your collaborative efforts, uh, as you described, uh, that you really bring together all the, the relevant industries, uh, that you've been doing that together. Well, later we'll also hear from Ilse from the, from the industry uh, perspective of one particular industry, uh, but, uh, but also the, the other elements that you mentioned, uh, like uh, really the, uh, the issue of the competitiveness, uh, also the need uh, to, to work together uh, with the with the uh, with the international uh, partners and really to have uh, the, um, the 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 good strategies in place. If I may uh, just ask you, what in your view you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, the the new funding particular funding um, uh, in your case, uh, but um, in your uh, experience, which are the instruments actually which have the greatest impact? Uh, when it comes to deployment, uh, whether it's EU, national, regional strategies, uh, funding schemes alignment, well, market pool measures uh, such as public procurement, perhaps you can also a bit develop that point. Well, we'd all love to have a magic stick, you know, sometimes in order to shorten the name of my ministry, I sometimes say working for the Ministry of Magic, but alas, uh, the way I look at these, at all the different measures you just mentioned and I just mentioned as an answer to the first question as really a big puzzle. And this is really how you should look at it. There is no magic stick. It's really a puzzle and we do have to turn around every single stone. Why? Because, especially from the perspective of research and innovation, we are really moving beyond the linear view we tended to have for a very, very long time. Everything needs to happen at the, at the same time. To give you an example, um, one of our largest steel company, Faust, um, they started building uh, these electric arc furnaces, two of them. And when they're done in 2027, um, they will save three to 4% of Austria's CO2 emissions. So this is a huge deal. They're building these. But at the same time, there are so many questions still open, which is why we need R&I. And we also not, uh, and another, another thing that's important is not just looking at the established industries, uh, but also look at potential new industries that could develop. That's another important element for um, competitiveness. And I really view um, initiatives like uh, the European CHIPS Act or also NZIA, the Net Zero Industries Act, as first attempts also the, of the European Commission to, to get a better grip of this puzzle, right? Um, some things we could use a bit better, I want to mention maybe, because uh, I don't want to repeat all the different policy instruments you all know and you can all think of. Um, some things we try and use to better, um, to better avail is uh, foresight, research and technology infrastructures, and the corresponding business models. That's important, also on a European scale. Um, also, R&I for technology development and system solutions. This is not, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a 
puzzle of policy measures, but it's also, it's also a puzzle of solutions. So when we talk about systemic change, we also talk about systemic solutions. So what we try and do is try and have a good mix of system transformation measures, but also uh, technology measures. Um, what we hear from the companies a lot, and this is, I guess, a huge issue in a lot of countries, is think of the public sector of more of a customer for the green products, the green steel, the green aluminium, the green cement uh, that we then produce. Um, obviously, we also need consequent monitoring and evaluation, and it's a different kind of evaluation, I'm convinced. It's a, it's a constant learning evaluation we need there, and that's a, that these are also different, very collaborative mechanisms. And again, aligning national, EU, and international activities. Um, the research programming also needs to focus more on skills and capacity building in specific areas. Um, and obviously, you know, because the previous section, Pascal Ami managed, uh, mentioned, rightly mentioned, that we see a bit of a backlash on the Green Deal. Um, we see uh, the Green Deal being framed as this huge bureaucratic monster um, where a lot of companies tell us we have to hire X people to actually do all the reporting requirements. And I, I would think, and this is why I think the collaboration is so important, that we need to get back to this race for the future, this race for a better future I mentioned in the beginning. Well, many thanks, uh, Henriette, as, as we are a bit um, lagging behind. Um, let me before, uh, now taking the industry perspective, very short question, because you already mentioned um, uh, the international collaboration and that you are leading together with, the, with Australia in mission innovation, net, uh, uh, net zero industry part. Uh, uh, do you think that something similar should be also done uh, between uh, between the the EU member states? Um, I think we have a, we have really good, and I, I guess you will mention these planner for process. We have we have a lot of partnerships. Uh, we have a lot of programs, and what we try and do also in our capacity as leading the mission with Australia and a number of other countries, Korea, India, etc. Um, but also coordinating something that, like the CTIP is trying to align all the different initiatives we have at EU level, also with the international level. Um, obviously, the call of member states to ourselves and to the Commission is always to better coordinate, better align, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think we have a lot of good activities going on, and the challenge now is to, to build this puzzle better together. Very well. Now, uh, this was the, uh, the perspective from the, uh, from the national point of view, uh, the case of Austria. Uh, but now, let me turn to uh, uh, the, the next speaker. Uh, Ilse, you represent a lime production company, uh, Carmers. Uh, and uh, really, I'd like to ask you to share now with us the industry perspective. Uh, let me uh, just put the question like that. Um, well, we, we know that the cement, lime industry, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, remain tightly coupled with the production, while some of the other sectors like steel manage to decouple uh, emissions from produ production. Now, given, uh, the, given the 2050 climate neutrality targets uh, and also the need, as we said, that we need to keep the industry in Europe, uh, how is your sector addressing that from the research and innovation perspective? Uh, yes, correct. So uh, I, I will not repeat the question on the fact that we need to stay in Europe. Uh, so that's, that's obvious. But uh, I just first, before I set the scene, I would like to explain a bit what the challenge of the lime and the cement sector is. Because uh, how do you produce lime? So you produce lime by uh, taking limestone. You put it in a kiln, uh, very simply set. You, you heat up the kiln. And through the combustion, you basically break down the product uh, limestone into lime and CO2. So for every ton of lime we produce, we basically produce also one ton of CO2, which today gets emitted. So it means, and that's a challenge we share with, uh, with the cement industry, so it means uh, even if we would convert all of our production onto uh, green fuels uh, and, and, and low carbon fuels, we're still left with those process emissions. And that means we can't uh, meet the objectives of the Green Deal without um, 
um, innovating and without using carbon capture technologies, which today uh, there's a few carbon capture technologies, but they're not all suited to a smaller size installation like the lime industry. Uh, and so we, we need to innovate. We cannot, we cannot do it without it. And the lime industry is actively uh, embarking on that journey. Reason being, uh, uh, there's a lot of activity behind, uh, around it, but there's a timeline we need to meet. So there's a lot of uh, cross-industry collaboration. So the EULA, that's our, uh, our industry association, we collaborate at the level of EULA, uh, but also within companies' levels. I see uh, innovation, the activity in innovation, stepping up to levels never seen in the past. Uh, um, the lime industry has always innovated on product level, but today we, we focus a lot on process innovation. And uh, within my company, it, it has trans translated towards building from scratch over the last uh, three to four years, a team of 25 individuals, so uh, uh, engineers focusing on decarbonization solutions. Uh, and those professionals, they manage uh, our individual company project, but also uh, a lot of the project managed across the, the, the sectors uh, and European projects such as uh, Cal by 2030, C4U, but also Columbus project, which is, for example, a, a CCU, a utilization uh, project. So uh, activity in R&I is, 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 is the only way for us to meet the objectives of the Green Deal. Well, many, many thanks, Ilse, for, for explaining that uh, now. Was, uh, as I come from Estonia and, and the, the whole country is lying, is, is lying on limestone, <laughs> so <laughs> this, is, this is also something, uh, the, the mineral that I know very well, uh, with, with, with several uses, of course. Uh, but now, um, uh, many thanks for uh, underlining uh, well, all the, the different innovation efforts uh, that your industry is doing, which, uh, which are very much uh, laudable, also looking into the process, uh, the, the carbon capture, but I guess also now the technologies are being developed, how to, to capture and then use uh, the emissions for something useful. So certainly this is uh, the, also the potential possibility uh, for your sector. But now my second question would be, uh, because industry is now uh, recalling for reinvented industrial deal uh, for Europe, and now how would you see the role of research and innovation in this context? So uh, I think with uh, the Antwerp Declaration, the industry has shown that we all support uh, the Green Deal and we want to meet the objectives of the Green Deal, but there's more, uh, more needed to be successful. And that's why we have the industrial, uh, uh, so the, the Antwerp Declaration, which was signed by almost 800 signatories. So it's a very broad, there's a very broad support platform uh, for this declaration. And one of the key elements highlighted in this declaration is the call for a more flexible uh, innovation framework, but also a call for acceleration of scaling up uh, research uh, and innovation efforts. So uh, we, we can innovate as much as we want, but if we stick into a low TRL phase and we can't get it towards industrial scale, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not, never going to get there. So, so basically, uh, what we see is we, we, we're doing a lot already at European level. There's very good collaborations, but we can probably do even more. Uh, if I look to initiatives like Aspire, uh, those are really public-private uh, partnerships where, where uh, there's a, a broad acceleration framework created for topics like decarbonization, recyclability, but also operational improvements, and also uh, accelerating the, the scale-up of technologies. And, and those type of partnerships, sharing competencies across industry, private, public, uh, uh, bodies that's, uh, that's really required to, uh, to make it successful. Well, Ilse, you already referred to the, the need um, for scaling up. And uh, we've also seen the example in video of retrofit. Uh, now, uh, also for, for Karmers, uh, uh, when it comes up to scale up the industrial uh, demonstrators and really bringing R&I investments to the market, why do you see uh, the, 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 main, the main hurdles in doing that? 
So I'll talk from a life example because as we speak, we are actually uh, almost finishing the construction of a, an industrial demonstrator, so a new type of kiln that allows to concentrate the CO2 at the level of the kiln to then later on capture it and, and, and move it towards sequestration. Uh, but we see uh, uh, quite some hurdles to, to, to go towards mass deployment because that's what we need at industrial scale. And I would say it's threefold. On the, on the one hand side, uh, there's an economic hurdle. Uh, these installations, especially Especially at first of a kind when you're not yet in a standard mode they're, they're very expensive and for that we're very grateful for the innovation fund framework that is there but we also need uh, a, a larger acceptance of, of the consumers of, a, of, a, of the willingness to pay for decarbonized products. Eh? So, so that's a key lever to make it economic and, and stay competitive. Uh, second, uh, w the permitting process. Eh? So there is more and more regulation coming and permitting uh, processes become more difficult and more lengthy. And so we need to take a step back or I would say a step forward to again uh, make it more flexible and, and make sure that we stimulate uh, green investments in, in Europe instead of, uh, I would say, uh, not promote them. And then lastly, for us, very specific to us and the cement sector, as we deal with those process uh, emissions, we can, we can partially put it in utilization, but, but that's not the full answer to it. So we need to sequester as we're a hard to abate industry. And for that, we need CO2 infrastructure. That means a pipeline, that means a sequestration field. And so with Europe already putting in place the industrial uh, carbon management strategy, that's a very good step. And we would like to now see it translated into uh, an actual action plan and, uh, and, uh, and the, the right legislative framework to execute it. So. <laughs> Well, many thanks. There are, uh, well, many thanks for uh, underlining the hurdles and also pieces of advice <laughs> how we can do a better uh, on the, uh, at the EU level. Uh, but uh, before concluding this session, uh, let me briefly inform what is already being done. Uh, at the EU level in order really to, to support uh, the industries uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the implementation of the European Green Deal. Uh, well, actually, uh, the EU is building uh, a comprehensive approach uh, to boost uh, industrial transformation uh, towards climate neutral and competitive industries. And um, this future is in line with the Green Deal industrial plan. As you know, on the legislative side, we have the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, the Net uh, Zero Industry Act and Fit for 55 legislation. And the purpose of all of that is really to provide a predictable and also stimulating environment. Uh, but certainly there are a lot of things uh, also happening uh, on research and innovation and certainly things to be continued and developed further. Uh, but already you referred to the um, European partnerships. Uh, I'd like to highlight particularly uh, Process for Planet and the Clean Steel partnerships, uh, which uh, really uh, focus on delivering climate and circular solutions to a wide range of industries. Not only those that we mentioned, but also metals, pulp and paper, glass, ceramics and so on. And with the overall combined budget of more than 4 billion uh, euros, uh, that is both public and private investments, they are already supporting uh, projects from TRL 6 to 8 uh, uh, and uh, in order to ensure uh, a portfolio of technologies and also demonstrators to, to put in place. Now, but what we'd really like to do and to do uh, more and better in the future is to have a deployment agenda uh, for the energy intensive industries. And this is also something that you referred to. So we would not stop with showing uh, existing demonstrators. Uh, last June, we published a report uh, on 180 demonstrators. Now we move to the, from the world of demonstrators uh, to the successful deployment. And um, certainly uh, what we uh, want to do is to mobilize investors, uh, including European Investment Fund. Uh, uh, we want also want to tackle uh, deployment with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the efforts that I, uh, that I already uh, uh, mentioned. And certainly uh, now together with the uh, member states, uh, we 
catalyze member states to mobilize more funding. We also started a mutual learning exercise uh, under ERA uh, and certainly more to be done uh, until the end of this framework program, but also with the, uh, with the next. Now, I'm afraid uh, we are coming uh, to the close of this session. Uh, if I may, just uh, uh, to ask uh, one sentence uh, uh, from both speakers uh, before we, we conclude. I think we live in uh, extremely exciting times, so we have uh, a lot of uh, competencies in Europe to, uh, to make it work, so we should step up in terms of collaboration and, uh, and sharing. I can only underline this. <laughs> Everyone sleep. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>